Hello, everyone. My name is Raja Zaglul. I'm one of the fellows in Washington University in St. Louis, and I am part of the Fellows in Training on the Go initiative in the ACC. And we have the pleasure of having Dr. Deepak Bhatt with us today to tell us more about his recently presented trial, the SCORE trial, where he looked at sotagliflozin to reduce the effect, to reduce myocardial infarction, strokes, and death in patients. And Dr. Bhatt does not need introductions, but for those of you who do not know Dr. Bhatt, he's one of the leading clinical trialists of our age. He is a professor of medicine in Harvard, and he is in the Brigham and Women's Hospital currently. Dr. Bhatt, thank you so much for joining us. And um, if you can tell us a little bit about the clinical trial that you just presented and how it applies to our like training. Great. Well, thank you very much for those kind words and uh, asking me about the SCORE trial, which you're right, I just presented at ACC. Uh, just uh, a quick recap first. So what SCORE studied was sotagliflozin versus placebo. And sotagliflozin is an SGLT2 inhibitor. Of course, everyone at this point knows that the SGLT2 inhibitors have really large effects on reducing heart failure endpoints and kidney endpoints. And in the SCORE trial, we enrolled 10,000 plus patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and indeed found a significant reduction in heart failure related events. Those primary data were presented as a late breaker at AHA in 2020 and published in the New England Journal of Medicine as well. Uh, what I presented yesterday was the data with respect to MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events. And uh, there, in addition to the heart failure reduction score, we also saw a significant reduction in MACE, cardiovascular death, MI, stroke. In fact, MI is an individual endpoint that is total fatal and non-fatal MIs, as well as stroke as an individual endpoint. Again, total fatal and non-fatal stroke, each of those was significantly reduced in the overall SCORE trial. And what I built upon and presented at ACC now was looking at that MACE benefit as a function of whether patients did or did not have cardiovascular disease at baseline, a pre-specified analysis. And about 5,000 plus patients did have a history of cardiovascular disease, about 5,000 didn't. So uh, somewhat evenly matched subgroups. And uh, the bottom line is there was a consistent benefit in each of those subgroups. So MACE reduction in the overall trial, MACE reduction in the patients with a history of cardiovascular disease, and even MACE reduction in the lower risk patients without a history of cardiovascular disease. So again, they all had diabetes and chronic kidney disease, so they weren't super low risk, but, but at least they didn't have known established cardiovascular disease. As well, we looked within the cardiovascular disease patients, whether they had a history of coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular disease or peripheral artery disease, and again, found consistent benefits uh, across those three subgroups. Uh, we also looked at safety, and, and the main safety data are published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they are it has the same side effects that the SGLT2 inhibitors have as a class, uh, things like general mycotic infections, diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, the one additional side effect sotagliflozin has is diarrhea, uh, about 2.5% a higher rate uh, in going from about 6 to 8.5% uh, in the sotagliflozin versus placebo arm. And that's almost certainly due to the fact that this is also an SGLT1 inhibitor. And that might also account for the MACE reduction. So the SGLT1 is expressed in the gut, and inhibition there delays glucose absorption. So that additional effect, in addition to the SGLT2 and also SGLT1 inhibition in the kidney, might be explaining why we're seeing not just a heart failure reduction, but a MACE reduction. And sort of corroborating the MACE reduction, I also presented a meta-analysis of all the sotagliflozin trials, the phase two, the phase three, the type one diabetes trials, and there is also a consistent reduction in MACE there when looking at 20,000 plus patients. And, you know, not that one necessarily looks for such things, but, you know, statistically significant as well. So that tells me that the MACE reduction, you know, is real. Uh, and is it the SGLT1 inhibition that's doing it? Possibly. Of course, the other explanation is it's the specific population we studied. That is diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And EMPA kidney? Uh, was just uh, stopped early, and there was a press release about it. That's empagliflozin in patients with chronic kidney disease. So we'll have to see. If there's a reduction in MI and stroke in that trial, then I'd say, yeah, it's probably a class effect, but you don't see the MACE reduction in heart failure patients, but you see it in patients that are at high cardiovascular risk, such as those with chronic kidney disease. On the other hand, if empagliflozin doesn't show a reduction in MACE, 
And I say it's probably the SGLT1 that's specific to sodical flows. I mean, there are other uh, drugs out there in development that also have SGLT1 inhibiting uh, capability, but at least as far as things that might be available to patients in the intermediate term, you know, sodical flows in, uh, is the only SGLT1 slash SGLT2 inhibitor that, that fits that description. The data uh, will be submitted uh, to the FDA by the company, so we have to see if it gets approved or not. Uh, but uh, if it does get approved, you know, potentially an option for patients that are at high risk to not only reduce heart failure and kidney-associated risk, but even MACE. Thanks so much. That was wonderful. One question I had is in terms of accessibility to the patients, because we, we sometimes struggle with patients to be able to afford the SGLT2 inhibitors, the empagliflozin and on the others. Do you think this is going to be a similar issue or it like worse or better in terms of like having insurance companies and patients accessibility for this medication? I think that's a terrific question. I mean, there's great data for the class of SGLT2 inhibitors that are vastly underprescribed. I would say that the majority of patients with diabetes, uh, with heart failure, either with or without diabetes, with either reduced or preserved ejection fraction or in between, and patients with chronic kidney disease, again, with or without diabetes, I think the vast majority of those types of patients should be on an SGLT2 inhibitor, barring a contraindication. And I'd say, which one? Whichever one's on your formulary, whichever one's cheapest. Uh, but right now, none of them are that cheap because they're all, you know, currently branded, at least, you know, in the U.S., there's uh, certainly no generics. Uh, they start to go generic in about uh, I think four or five years. So eventually there's going to be generic uh, SGLT2 inhibitors that are out there. As far as sodical flows, it's not even approved at this point in time. It's investigational. Uh, and the way this typically works is companies would never price a drug until it's actually approved. Once it's approved, they'll see how broad the label is. If it's a very narrow label, that will typically be a pretty expensive drug. If it's a pretty broad label, it's probably still, you know, an expensive drug, but uh, there are different factors that, that, that go into that sort of calculation. So I, I don't know what it would be priced as if it gets approved. I, I would have no say in that. Every time I've led a trial and, you know, told the company sponsoring it to price the drug reasonably, you know, they haven't listened once, so I, I doubt they're going to listen this time. Uh, but uh, if they were smart, what they would do is price it a little bit less than the other SGLC tunibers that are already on the market. So uh, not that I'm a business person, but you know, I've, I've been doing uh, trials and working with companies for a while. I, I think actually that'd be a really uh, bright strategy. But you know, I made that recommendation to the Prazigrel folks when, when Prazigrel was getting launched. I said, just price it a little bit cheaper than at that time, still branded Clopidogrel, you know, but they didn't. They priced it more. It caused more bleeding and it never gained the traction that in fact the strength of data uh, would have deserved. So you know, the, the, the folks that make these decisions aren't MDs, even at the companies. You know, it's not MDs, it, it's business folks. A lot of times I don't understand the business decisions they make. I actually think as an MD, I'd make better business decisions than, than, than some of those MBAs make. But, uh, you know, uh, such is our lot in life as physicians. Uh, sometimes other people control important decisions that affect our lives or our patient lives. But, but, but I don't anticipate until the SGLT2 inhibitors start going generic that there's going to be any uh, great change in that dynamic. Having said that, though, you know, a lot of times as physicians or patients or media, you know, we focus on the price of drugs. And yeah, branded drugs are expensive in the U.S. There's, there's no denying that truth. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're not still providing value. I mean, think about the SGLT2 inhibitors. If you're preventing hospitalizations for heart failure, those are really expensive, you know. Uh, in terms of the Medicare budget, a good chunk of the Medicare budget is spent on hospitalizing people with heart failure. So, you know, w w while drug costs, you know, I'm not going to be someone defending uh, the high cost of drugs. The reality is, you know, a lot of money does go into research and development, and at least for drugs where there's really good efficacy data, uh, they can help reduce healthcare costs in other ways. Uh, you know, our healthcare system just has to be a little bit smarter in terms of how it, it deals with those issues. So, for the right patient, uh, certainly uh, drugs uh, such as SGLT2 inhibitors can be effective, but also can be cost effective. Thank you so much, Dr. Bart. We were very lucky to have you, and thank you for sharing your insight with us.